Welcome to this special edition of Voices of History. I'm Larry Capetto, creator of this channel. Folks, I have a special feature at today. This is something different. I've done a lot of interviews over the years. I produce a lot of videos like this. You're going to see today a little short snippets of some of my veterans. Some of you ask me at times for more information about my veterans, so you might uh, consider sponsoring a story. Well, this has 10 veterans featured that I interviewed in Algona, Iowa in August of 2006. I've got Vietnam veterans, World War II, Korean veterans, and a veteran from Iraq. So I want you to listen to these stories. Uh, these are just snippets of their entire interviews. And if, if something pulls on your heart, tugs on your heart, and you want to sponsor the full story that are in my archives, please contact me. There's information in the video description, like always. You click on the link, you include the name of the veteran that you want to sponsor. And at the end of the video, video you'll see the 10 veteran names, so you can decide who you want to sponsor. And then you can go, or you can go to my website, LarryCapetto.com, click on Sponsor a Vet. Same thing, you click on the link, you decide who you want to sponsor, just add the name of the veteran in your comment as you would donate to my work and sponsor the story, and then that's how uh, I will know who you want to do that with. So, at the beginning of this video, folks, you saw some names. I want to thank all of you for, all the people that were included in that list for helping sponsor my work. You are why I'm able to do my work, so I, I take to heart everybody that has has given towards this work and sponsored these stories and I just wanted to thank you. Special thank you to John Penn and James Gardner for your support of my work. God bless you sirs. I, I salute you and thank you for your, your, just your patriotism and your dedication to our country and our veterans and for helping me with this work. So I just want to give honor to whom honors do folks. We want to honor our veterans. I want to honor those who are helping making these stories possible. So, But this is a special feature. I, I love this. This is a 15 minute video with some great music and you'll get a little idea of what these veterans went through. This was in Algona, Iowa, like I said, in 2006. I have many other featurettes like this that I'm going to start introducing to the Voices of History channel. Also, I want you to see what I'm doing in the schools. I've spoken to over 100,000 students over 20 years now in our schools, over 100 schools across this country. So I want to start bringing some of those stories to you too. So if you have any interest in that, let me know too, because we need to get this out to our young people. I get many comments that this should be mandatory showing in all schools, and I totally agree with that especially with the way our country is right now and the, and the division in our country today. So these stories are paramount for our history and our learning going forward and, and hopefully learning from the history. So history is best learned from those that were there. That's what the teachers tell me in the school. So thank you again for supporting my work, for sponsoring this work. If you want to comment, if you want to, excuse me, if you want to comment, I want you to comment on the videos, but if you want to actually donate to my work too, you can do that in the comment section. So, but just include the name of the veteran. If, it, if something inside says, I want to sponsor that veteran, let me know. Again, you click on the link, it's under the video description and it will take you to the page and all you got to do is include the name of the veteran. So God bless you. Thank you for sharing these stories. Subscribe to this channel. And my heart's full, folks. Thank you. And I'm happy to bring this story to you. I was drafted uh, in 1971, February 71, and ended up three years in the military or in the army. Took a raw kid out of out of Cornfield, Iowa, and put him halfway around the world. I had a brother that was killed in the service in November of 1968, 
and uh, I was going to college. I was just out of high school going to college. Well, see, I graduated from training in 42, and it was right after Pearl Harbor. And I, I just felt like that, that I should do that. I was in college, and I went through the ROTC program. I got commissioned right when I same day I graduated from college. I was a scared kid when I went over there. Jeez, you know, 17 years old, <laughs> go on 18. God, my mother had a sign for me to get in the Army. Yeah, and anyway, went through basic training, and right after basic training, I was on the way to Korea. I had my basic training down in Florida, and uh, after six weeks of training, I was sent home on my furlough, and uh, then I was shipped out to Atterbury, Indiana, where I joined up with the 106th Division. Well, a lot of the nurses that I knew had joined, and uh, it was just seemed like the thing to do. I knew it was inevitable that I'd be drafted sometime. Probably at least 10 to 12 of us that was drafted at the same time I was that when we went together. It was very scary, the first encounter I ever had. I was really scared. <laughs> but as you live in the environment, you adapt to it, and you eventually you adjust, you know, who to trust, who not to trust. I can remember getting off the plane, and it was so hot. It was like stepping out in front of a blow dryer. The wind was blowing a little bit, and it was so hot and so dry. And then I remember when I arrived, uh, we went out on a deuce and a half. And uh, I remember, you know, God, I, I had a death grip on my M16, and I'm looking everywhere. And When we did go, uh, we went over on the ship. We landed there at uh, Inchon. At times, it got pretty rough there, but uh, it was, uh, it had snow and it was cold and it was, uh, there was a lot of lives lost there. And, uh, well, these were these Chinese troops coming down at us. You know, they joined the South Korean or North Korean troops, then to come at us. They walk over top of each other. I mean, they, they're so, I think what you call they were so brainwashed. I guess that's what you call it. I don't know, but I think that's what you call it. Because you could shoot down a line of them and there'd be another line right behind them. And there were uh, bells, they'd start bells and bugles, all this before they'd start to push. Well, you knew they were coming. And so you're lined up here in your foxholes, you know, all these bodies laying on the road. You know, I, it was just sickening. I just, it was sickening because but what could you do? I mean, we're all getting pushed back. I mean, the Chinese, the, the Chinese over, overwhelmed us, you know. They just, this is a big push that the Chinese were making. And we had dead bodies all over. But I, all I remember is this one buddy, a real good buddy of mine, and he, and he got off at Inchon, and I haven't heard from him since. I felt pretty invincible at the time, and, and like I said, I, I, I went there, uh, I wanted to see combat, and, and I wanted to get involved in the fight, and uh, until it happens, then, then you start to change your mind, you know, but, but I was ready. Um, I remember the first time that we went into a, uh, we call a hot uh, landing zone, uh, I almost burnt the barrel off the M60 because I was you're supposed to shoot at spurts and my finger was just glued on that thing. I was scared to death. You're very nervous. I mean, you're wondering how hot the LZ is and uh, how quick you can unload and get a defensive position set up so you're not a moving target. I had instances where I didn't know if I'd come home or not, but Lord, Lord willing, I did. We were the recipient of numerous mortar attacks. I had a, a soldier that, he was coming through a checkpoint right at, at the Baghdad airport, and his truck hit a, took a direct round with mortar, and a soldier was killed. There was this explosion, and I remember the force. It, it's like slammed me to the ground. Slammed me to the ground. When I opened my eyes, I mean, dust and 
I could taste the sulfur on my lips. And then I looked to the side of me, and uh, there was a very good friend of ours, and uh, uh, half of his back had been blown away. So then I turned around to see how Bruce is doing, because he's the guy that was helping me. And uh, when I turned around to see him, uh, all, all, I couldn't see anything but blood and flesh. And uh, I thought that, uh, I thought that his head had been blown off. I had an experience when I first got home. Um, a small town uh, has a volunteer fire department and the fire whistle went off one night about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, that fire alarm in my hometown was the same as our air raid f uh, sound in Vietnam. And I mean, I hadn't been home maybe two nights. And that thing went off and uh, it's dark outside. I jump up out of bed. I don't know where I'm at. Uh, I run outside and I just sat down in the middle of the, middle of the yard there and just started crying because I had absolutely no idea where I was at. And uh, uh, I remember my dad coming out and uh, putting his arm around me and just hugging me. Before the invasion, we could almost tell something was going to be happening. We had to wear our helmets and, I mean, uh, hang our helmets on the end of our bed and the gas mask, and we wore impregnated clothing, and we were set up in the southern part, right across the channel from where the invasion did take place. Before D-Day, we didn't leave the post for 48 hours. I remember we saw all this equipment, you know, before that was, but we didn't know, of course, what was going to happen. That was always kept very quiet. We were supposed to get the casualties right back over, and then they bombed the port there, so. We were supposed to get the first patients. We had put up, ooh, like maybe 14 tents on cement pads, and we did have a radio on it said that the invasion had started. Well, we went into Normandy, and uh, well, our tanks went in uh, uh, D plus seven. Yeah, they told us a little about uh, what to expect, but our tanks were attached to the 29th Division. It looked like a mess. Yeah. There was ships sunk all around, the LSTs were sunk, and well, I saw one of our tanks that had been hit by an 88, and the, the guys all perished in the tank. You know, when you think about uh, the 18 and 19 year old boys that had never been away from home and were sent over there. Of course, I didn't see that, but they talked about how the water was just red when they went over at D-Day, you know, from all the, well, all the wounds and stuff. But as I was out on night patrol, I, uh, I could hear the Germans moving in, and I went up to the headquarters to report in, and I got no reply. I called in twice. I said, the Germans are coming, and I said, I want you to know about it. We got up there, and uh, four o'clock we was, they put the white flag up, and we surrendered and started marching, and, and uh, there was a lot of days and a lot of nights that we didn't have any food or water. They told us not to drink out of the water that was running in the ravines because we'd get sick or dysentery. Well, you know when you're thirsty, well, you'd break the orders, and we did, and we did get dysentery. We got so lousy that when you would lay down at night, you could just feel them lice running over your body. You take your shirt off or your and in the seams, it was just white with a mass of eggs. And that's the way we had to live. What a wonderful feeling when we got back into American hands. I'm free. If we wouldn't have went over there and helped out, I think Hitler would have came right straight through and we probably wouldn't have the freedom that 
you and I enjoy today. And I've said this many times, uh, if it wasn't for the World War II veterans, people would probably be saying Heil Hitler. Well, obviously freedom isn't free. You've heard that a thousand umpteen times. Um, I think that we do have a, a duty to uh, strive for that freedom as, as an American. I love freedom. And uh, uh, I think America is the best place in the world. Faults, God knows we got plenty. But uh, having been to other places, I'll take America any day. You're free to do what you want to do. You know, you go where you want to go without any problems. We were fighting over Korea to keep this freedom that we got in the United States. If we wouldn't have soldiers out there to fight these battles, we wouldn't have the freedom that we have today. I don't think you can put a price on freedom. We're just so lucky that uh, we got men that went to the service. They knew that they were gonna get shot at. They knew that they'd probably get wounded. They knew that they maybe would not never get home. But they, they gave up their life to protect America. That we have the freedom that you and I have today. Freedom's not free. Somebody pays for freedom. And sometimes it's you or somebody else, but uh, they better appreciate it. I'm very proud of our American flag. It's always been there, and uh, I'm proud to salute it as it goes by. The flag is very, very special to me, and I I feel awful when I see them desecrate the flag. I just, I just think it's awful. It means a lot to me, the flag. It's beautiful to see, flag. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. I fly my flag because I love it. It means freedom. <laughs> and every time I hear the Star Spangled Banner, I get wishy, wishy, you know? But it's still a beautiful song you know, and the, and the flag up there is flying. I got one in my place. It flies day and night. I got lights up there. But I am red, white, and blue. I fly the flag. I sell flagpoles. I erect them. I, I'll do whatever I can uh, to promote the flag. Now it means everything to me. It means freedom. It means uh, something that I fought for. Most wonderful thing you ever saw. When we got to see that first American flag, Give me liberty or give me death. What a wonderful feeling. That flag means so much to us. It should mean so much to everybody because that represents the freedom that we enjoy. Flag is really important. The flag is what we defended. <laughs>